10 Egyptian gods and their origins. Hey Crash, today we're going to talk about 10 Egyptian gods, more specifically what they represent and how they came about. Egyptian gods? Really? Sounds kind of boring. Can we do Greek gods instead? Egyptian gods are far from boring, trust me. There's some really messed up stuff to explore here, but I don't want to spoil it too early, so let's just jump right in. Number 1. Where better to kick off this list than with the original god himself, Ra. Ra is typically represented as a man with the head of a hawk crowned with a solar disc, and is the supreme sun god. Someone certainly thinks highly of himself. Well, in fantasy, he has good reason to be. He pretty much created the world. The legend goes that before the world existed, there was simply a mess of chaotic waters. Ra's birth provided enough heat to dry out a patch of earth suitable for human existence. He literally created the Egyptian idea of order and justice, known as Mat. Last time I checked, your greatest achievement was dressing yourself. I've regressed actually. My caretaker dresses me now. My bad, I forgot how hopeless you actually are. Meanwhile, every night Ra travels in his solar boat into the underworld to defeat the allies of chaos, and then becomes reborn as a sunrise, thus explaining the day-night cycle. What do you do at night, Crash? I play Team Fortress 2 and hurl abuse at the noobs on my team, so I guess in a way, I'm also fighting the forces of chaos. Number 2. Following the creation of the world, Atum was born. Atum is typically represented as a man wearing a double crown and represents both creation and perfection. Finally! Someone I can relate to! I am so tired of being around imperfect people! Atum is seen as a potential being, one who incorporates all of the elements simultaneously. He created eight other gods which, together with himself, form the Ennead. These gods are the basis of the most important and agreed upon Egyptian myths, and eventually result in the line of Egyptian kings known as pharaohs. Have you ever created a person crash? Does my earwax sculpture count? No. No it does not. Atum first gave rise to Shu and Tefnut, gods in their own right who controlled dry and moist air respectively. Shu had a plumed headdress, whereas Tefnut had the head of a lioness. Ew, the god of moist air? What was her power? Making people's fucking clothes stick to their back? <laughs> Number 3. Shu and Tefnut then got it on and had two more kids, Nut and Geb. Whoa, 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 hold on. Aren't Shu and Tefnut siblings? I'm not sure I'm cool with this. Hey, I'm not gonna judge what the gods do when they get freaky. Let's just skip over that detail. Nut was the god of the sky and is usually represented as an elongated body stretching over people. Ugh, okay, this is gross. Ugh, look at this picture crash. Look at it! I think I'm actually gonna barf now! It only gets worse. You know how I said that Ra enters the underworld every night? Well, some myths say that instead he is eaten by Nut. In doing so, he releases all the deities from within himself and they form the stars in the sky. Then, whilst inside her, ugh, he fights a serpent demon called Apep, who represents chaos. No disgusting metaphor there, everyone. Let's just take it at face value. After this battle, Ra is birthed by Nut back into the world. The cycle in this way also represents death and resurrection. This is some seriously fucked up stuff, culture! What is wrong with you? Number 4. Geb, Nut's brother, was naturally the god of Earth to contrast his sister. He is typically pictured as having a snakehead or being a man with brown skin and... Naked? Wait, let me see that picture again. Oh god no, I thought that was his hand. Hey, come on, quit hogging the picture! Uh, I mean, d don't be so immature. Oh my boy. Right. It was said that earthquakes came about as a result of Geb's laughter, and that the dead were imprisoned within his body since they were buried there. Oh, and he's also the god of fertility. Well, I mean, that makes sense. What with his thing dangling around like that. I think I'm gonna dress as Geb for next year's Halloween party. Later on in his mythology, Geb became more closely associated with fertile earth and the raising of crops. Hence, he was seen more as a harvest god. Geb and Nut decided to have four kids of their own, because apparently they hadn't inbred enough at this point. Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Set were born, and this led to one of the most famous Egyptian myths. Number 5. Osiris is seen as the first king of Egypt, originally being the vegetation god. He is typically represented as a mummy holding the crook and flail of kingship, but his skin colour is of more interest. He can be depicted as different colours depending on what he is symbolising. Blue for the dead, black for the fertile earth, and green for resurrection. This confusion of meaning comes from his complicated backstory. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you, I feel like we're trying to explain the DC multiverse here. Well, there's a story relating to Osiris' death and subsequent resurrection by his sister and, you guessed it, wife, Isis. Due to this, he became seen as the god of the underworld, and of the dead. 
In death rituals, it was said that the soul was judged by Osiris. To do so, Osiris would weigh the person's heart against a white feather, the feather of Mat, and only if the heart was lighter would the person be allowed to pass on to the field of reeds, the Egyptian version of heaven. How could a heart be lighter than a feather? And what sort of horrible things would they do if your heart wasn't lighter? Apparently, if you failed the test, your heart would be devoured by a crocodile-headed demon known as Amenti. There was no hell, simply non-existence. Number 6. Despite being the god of the dead, Osiris was not evil. Now, his brother Set, on the other hand, well... He was a douche? Pretty much. Set killed Osiris so that he could become the king of Egypt. It gets worse from there, but we'll discuss that a bit later. Set was the god of darkness, chaos, and confusion, and was typically represented with the head of an unknown animal, sometimes referred to as a Typhonian. He would occasionally be a companion to Ra, riding with him on his solar boat and causing storms. Wow, what a dick. Why didn't the other gods just kill the asshole? They certainly hated him, as did most Egyptians, but the storms he caused were actually used to fight off Apep on Ra's journey through Nut. God, there's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Later on, Set took on the mantle of God of Foreigners, another negative attribute. During the Egyptians' war with the Assyrian and Persian empires, Set essentially became a symbol for the enemy and was thus reviled. Number 7. Osiris' sister and wife, Isis, is the goddess of health, marriage, and wisdom, among other things. In ancient Egypt, the name Isis means throne, referring to the throne she is usually depicted as wearing on her head. The reason for this will become obvious soon. You are the biggest tease, culture! I know. When Set killed Osiris, he supposedly dismembered him and spread his body across Egypt. Isis mourned the loss of her husband, and her tears were said to cause the annual flooding of the Nile. However, being the badass she is, she decided to collect his body together and resurrect him. Till death do us part obviously doesn't apply here. In some accounts, she even threw his penis into the Nile, where it was eaten by catfish. By far, Isis's strongest association is with motherhood, although it happened in kind of a messed up way. After resurrecting Osiris, they did the deed using a new golden phallus that Isis had made for him, and Isis conceived an heir to the throne, Horus. Look, I ain't saying she's a gold digger. But come on! She raised Horus in seclusion until the day he was strong enough to take back the throne from Set. Because of this, she is also seen as a carer, an Egyptian parallel to the Mother Mary in Christian faiths. Number 8. Horus, son of Osiris and Isis, became a champion for the Egyptian people. Horus is typically represented as a hawk or a human with the head of a hawk. In some depictions, he can also be seen as an infant being cared for by Isis. His many battles with Set for the throne are the best understood myths in Egyptian mythology. Wait! This is the plot of the Lion King! Osiris is Mufasa, Seth is Scar, and Horus is Simba! The names even have the same numbers of letters! I think the Egyptians ripped off Disney! Well, I mean, it was probably the other way around. I mean, this did happen 5,000 years before the Lion King. But you're definitely right with that. Multiple versions of this tale exist, but perhaps the best appreciated one sees Horus eventually defeat Set and take back his kingdom. Thus he restores Mart, becomes the king of the living, and performs his father's funerary rites. Osiris's position as the king of the dead symbolizes the relationship between a king and the deceased predecessors. Crash, are you crying? <laughs> no! Number 9. Thot is the king of writing and knowledge, typically being represented as a human with an ibis head holding scrolls or performing calculations. He typically acted as an intermediary between the gods, like Hermes did in Greek mythology, and is one of the oldest gods. No wonder you put him on this list. He's a nerd, just like you. Hey, this nerd is awesome. During the Day of Judgment described earlier, it was Thot's role to record the deeds of the person being judged. So he's a glorified court stenographer. Come on, give me something crazy! Okay, okay. Well, when Horus and Set were still fighting, there was one episode in which Set ripped out one of Horus's eyes. Thot, along with Hathor, were able to heal Horus's eye. Since this eye was still damaged, it was said to shine less brightly than the other, and hence this explains why the moon is dimmer than the sun. It also explains why the eye of Horus is a symbol of life and well-being in Egyptian culture. What?! This makes no sense! I thought Nut represented the sky, not Horus! It's confusing. There are a lot of different accounts from different cults trying to promote their own gods, and hence there's more than one interpretation of Egyptian mythos. Number 10. Last but not least is Anubis, the protector of the dead and god of embalming. He is the son of Set and Nephthys, making him Horus's cousin, but his inbred cousin. 
In any case, he's usually represented as a man with the head of a jackal. Despite his prominence in films and TV, he's actually quite underrepresented in Egyptian myth. He does have important roles in Egyptian death rituals, however, guiding both the scales themselves and guiding the individual through the process. Everything I know about Anubis, I learned from Yu-Gi-Oh! That show was the shit! You know how I said no one likes Set? Well, I wasn't kidding. Even his own son thinks he's a douche. One time when Set transformed into a leopard to try and attack the body of Osiris, Anubis interfered and stopped him by branding him with a hot iron. He then flayed Set and wore his skin to ward off other people who might desecrate the dead. This story was used to explain how the leopard got its spots. Ah, uh, the more you know. So there's 10 Egyptian gods and some of the mythology behind them. Pretty crazy, right Crash? I would have still preferred Greek gods. Jeez, you're so hard to please. Fine, we can cover them in a future episode. But for now, tell us about any other Egyptian gods you know in the comments below. Follow Culture Crash on social media!